Hey, this is Rogue. Now, making calls in deadlock is more important than you think. Uh, I wanted to put this video together because I know there's a lot of people that come from a lot of different backgrounds here joining us in deadlock. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of content out there around things like tips and tricks or, you know, character guides versus item breakdowns and things like that. But I think on more of that core esports side and, you know, especially on things like effective communication, I think there's not as many resources. So, I'm excited to put this together for people, whether you're either a veteran of main calling and like sort of what that looks like here in a game like Deadlock, or if you're someone who's new to calling or new to, again, this sort of collaborative team-based game in the first place. Uh, so what I wanted to go over is just effective communication in general in FPS type games and in games like Deadlock, which obviously is third person, but um, like, yeah, in games like this, what does effective communication look like? And then I wanted to kind of give an overview basically of what it looks like to be the main caller, like the in-game leader, the IGL, you know, the person doing the primary shot calling. Um, second, I wanted to break down what it looks like to be a secondary caller or kind of giving those supplementary calls, right, of like contributing effectively but not being the person who, you know, our whole strategy rides on your shoulders. And finally, what it looks like to be a person who doesn't love contributing verbally and doesn't love making calls themselves. Uh, but I think it's really important for these people to kind of go through what calling looks like in a context like deadlock because, you know, you can be the best player ever and you know drop 50 kills every single game but then it's like if your team doesn't have a way to effectively convert that really high performance into a win you're kind of selling yourself short right uh it's kind of like having a whole bunch of great food but not actually cooking it and and you know turning it into something that leads to a win right uh so great i guess we'll start off with what effective calls look like so uh in terms of like the information theoretic best calls what you want to do basically is convey as much information as you can in as little space as you can right so that's using uh clear concise short calls to convey uh what you're trying to get across to the team uh so in like an example you might want to say if you're ivy and you're laning against their infernus you might tell your laning partner like all right i'm going to stun their infernus so they'll be they'll be stunned in three seconds get ready to focus fire them together with me right uh something like that maybe is great if you're in the early laning phase where like a lot of people aren't communicating yet. There's not too much to say. You might have that kind of room. Uh, but what you want to do later on in the game, imagine in a big team fight where everyone's communicating, there's a lot going on. You might just make something as short as on Infernus, right? Uh, to kind of, again, get the point across that we should be focus firing Infernus, but without you taking up a lot of time. Like anyone who hears that knows what that means. Uh, so yeah, there's like some some cases of, of clear and concise calls. And, you know, there's a lot that goes into that in terms of like what works differently for different people on the team right um you know if it's early in the game you you all might have like a really open dialogue and want to communicate a lot around what you're trying to do um if it's the middle of a tense team fight i mentioned being short and concise uh some people might not understand what you're saying so if you want to take a second to break it down maybe the first time but then by the time you make that call for the fourth or fifth time you get to say hey do that thing again right and make it really short and simple so these are the types of calls that you're looking for. And in particular, you're looking for ways basically to convert stuff. You know, I see a lot of people who will call out like what they're doing all the time when they're trying to do an effective job at making calls. But, you know, for example, if it's very early days in your lane, you're looking for only a couple things like, you know, maybe the three things you could look for when you're starting off in your lane is what style are we playing in our lane? Like maybe how we want to organize, how we're going for these types of souls and where and when. Maybe you're looking for opportunities to say like, oh, based on our abilities, we should look for an opening like this to get into them. And then finally is creating those openings of like, okay, it's time to gank. It's time to go for a kill, things like that. Um, but you don't want to be just like constantly saying like, I'm going back to spawn. I'm going here. I'm going there. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Um, again, being concise is the important part. So uh, that's basically some examples broadly of what effective communication looks like in terms of the, the early game and different timings and stuff like that. But I want to now break it down into like sort of the three categories. And we'll start with, yeah, the in-game leader, the main caller, the primary shot caller, uh, whatever you like. So uh, what it looks like for this person, if you're the main caller, uh, that means sort of that the strategy of, the, of our team in this game rests on your shoulders. Right. What you're looking to do is basically kind of give everyone a beginning, middle and end of the way this game will go uh, or the way this fight will go or the way this objective will go and to create that context for everyone. Um, now, you might think if you're new to this or have not spent a lot of time calling, it's like, well, how am I supposed to know exactly what to do and when? Uh, a sort of theme that will look to convey basically throughout this, this uh, segment here is it's so much stronger and so much better to work together on a bad call than it is to wait and come up with the perfect call or avoid making a call because it's not perfect. Um, 
you know, there's there's so much basically in terms of focus fire, right? Where even just calling focus fire, even if it's the wrong target, it's so much more effective for your team to be on the same page and work together as a group because, you know, you can all focus fire this one thing, even if it wasn't the best frag at the time, you can now focus fire something else and, and do something with that kind of a play. Versus if there's no focus fire at all, you're all just, you know, shooting random, uh, random damage out there. And, you know, a team that is focus firing into you, you're going to lose your damage dealers a lot faster. Um, there are other cases where, you know, and this, this is another sort of, of my, my challenge to you here, uh, listening is, you know, any of those times that you're in a lane and your, your teammate does something so stupid, right? Like, oh my God, I can't believe they just dove this tower for no reason. Or why would you keep going for these fights? What are they doing? They're throwing the game. They're feeding this person, this and that. Anytime you feel these, uh, feelings of like, my team is doing something that I don't agree with. That is a very clear, immediate every single time example of when making calls would have helped you and your team. Like you will have a more likely chance of winning this game if you communicate with this person effectively. Uh, so what does that look like, right? Uh, basically you wanna kind of get on the same page where whatever you think is the right way of going about this game, very clearly this person you're having a problem with is having a different feeling of how to go about winning this game, right? Uh, so getting on the same page and communicating and saying either, hey, instead of that, I want to prioritize this. Can you go for this type of a play with me when I call it? And they might say, oh, sure. And you like pull them off something that they're doing wrong and put them onto something they're doing right. Or another great way of saying this is, again, not in a judgmental way, but saying like, hey, like quick question, like what were you looking for in that play? Like, why did you make it? Or why do you think it went wrong? Like, is there something I could do to help? And if they're like, oh yeah, I saw this window uh, for like my ability and I brought them down to like half of one bar. So if one person was ready once I fired this ability off uh, to help me focus fire this person, we're good to go. So suddenly you can say like, oh, this person isn't feeding. They're making a play that's very valuable, but just not sealing the deal. I can help with that. Right, so kind of looking for ways, and that's, that's very tactical in this case, but you're sort of looking for ways to enable and empower your teammates. Right, so I mentioned we're starting with the, the main caller, the primary strategist overall. So let's kind of break down some examples of what that looks like. Right, so when you load into a game, first and foremost, like nothing else is really going on except you're looking at the characters on the screen. What you want to start off with is saying sort of what your win conditions are, right? Um, so for example, if you have a team that's a lot tanker than the opposing team, you could say something like, ooh, for us, the longer a fight goes on, the better our chances are because we just have more health than them and better regen. So we're looking to sort of prolong these fights and stay in them for as long as we can. Um, if you're a team that maybe has like a double sniper or something like that, you might be conveying to your team, hey, our win condition here in, these, in, in our type of play here is to get a pick quickly. Basically, if that pick doesn't happen early on in the battle, then we're, we're really hard pressed to kind of find openings after that fact, after they've seen where we're coming from with our snipers. So uh, that's an example of like sort of the overarching strategy, right? You might look for other criteria and say, okay, we have a really good gankers on our team. So basically look for my call once the, you know, once we hit about eight minutes in the game, for example, I'll start making calls to look for ganks based on how the, the towers are looking at the time. So that's, again, a, a way that you kind of grounds the team and gravitates us towards this shared common goal. And even if you make bad calls, right, like even if ganking is the right way to win this game, even if you call to gank in the wrong lane, you know, the entire team knows that, okay, we are going to gank at this time. It's not worth it me doing it early and it's baiting if I do it late. Uh, they also know, like, if our main caller calls that, they're, that we are ganking yellow with this play, even if I'm in uh, blue at the time, I, and I think that's better. At least I'm aware that I'm not getting that gank. Whereas probably in your game, you're like, why isn't my ganker helping me and they're helping someone else? You know, so again, it just kind of disambiguous, makes it less ambiguous uh, to, to work together in, in this type of fashion. So those are the types of things you're looking to set up when you're loading into a game, right? What are our win conditions? What are the ways that we win team fights? What are the ways we win objectives? What are the ways we close the game, right? Like what are our sort of criteria based on our players at hand? Uh, now, once you're in the game, I mentioned like earlier in the laning phases, it's important, I think, to not like try too hard, so to speak, right? You know, you got to let the game breathe sometimes and uh, give that space to the rest of your team. So, you know, micromanaging people when it's been 45 seconds into the laning phase, that's not very helpful. Um, but if your team is now listless, like, wait a second, you know, the, the lanes have opened, we've passed that 10 minute mark. What does it look like for us to convert and start making things happen here on the map? That's when you really shine. So you're sort of looking for those opportunities to not just like say things for the point of saying them, but to use your communication to convert it into some kind of advantage, whether it's, you know, getting kills, getting souls, getting objectives, things like that, getting map control, whatever you like. Um, so yeah, breaking that down a little more, you kind of want to weigh up, I would say, what success looks like for your team and who's in a position to do it, right? And so here's where sort of there's a lot of branching paths in terms of what main calling looks like. 
Um, you know, for example, there's a drill sergeant, right? Like almost a micromanager. Some people work really well in main calling in a way that says like, okay, our inference is going to flame dash over here and then use his ult. After that, our uh, Kelvin will ice path in and dome them and keep them there and things like that. And, you know, kind of itemizing exactly what will happen and when, you know, choreographing this whole song and dance. Um, so that's one option that works really well for people who have that like strong cohesive idea of like the deep mechanics of the game and how well they interact. Um, and for people who respond well to that, they respond well in cases where it's like, you know, it kind of absolves people, right? It helps to say like, you know, we all have different separate ideas of what good plays look like. Uh, and, but if I'm listening to my main caller, who's that drill sergeant to tell me exactly what to do, I get to have my path kind of charted out for me and a little bit of wiggle room to kind of fine tune it and, and help. Uh, there are cases though where that doesn't work super well, where like, I'm sure you can imagine, like if you dictate something to someone in a random game, they might not respond very well to it. Uh, so I think it's important if you're that drill sergeant kind of uh, main caller is to number one, look for opportunities when like the team actually needs you to be that fine green. Uh, and number two, put, phrase it in a way that's like more positive in a way that like helps them, helps set them up for success, right? Uh, and again, makes very clear that it's not their fault if the play goes poorly. Uh, if you're someone who's working with a main caller that is that drill sergeant, um, then you work very well to say yes and to add your adjustments after the fact, right? You know, picking apart this person's play in the middle of the round, it's going to be pretty, like, it slows them down. It slows you down. Your whole team is now arguing about what's the right thing to do, and you're doing nothing at all in this meantime. So even if it feels uncomfortable, just give it a shot listening to their play, and then you can adjust as the, as the round goes on. Uh, now, personally, my style of in-game leading is uh, very different. So... I'm looser in the way that I'm not that micromanager drill sergeant. I don't care how you do something. I care a lot more about what you do. Uh, and the way I would describe it is I, uh, someone described it as a superstar whisperer, right? So basically listening to what people um, do well naturally in terms of their play style and what they're trying to do here on the server, maybe based on what character they're playing or how they've played so far. Um, but basically listening, what are the strengths of this person? What comes naturally to them? What are they already really good at doing? How do I set them up and facilitate them to shine in this context, right? So the way that might look is, let's say we have a game where we start off and our Yamato is like 0-3. Like for some reason, we're six minutes in the game of they died three times. The question is why, right? Uh, so in this case, it seems like they're looking to initiate a lot of the time, but not having that follow-up. So I'll look at a person like that and say, great, they are our initiator. We are starting our fights as a group based on what this person is doing. So even if this person is completely off mic and not listening to our calls at all, I'll still see when this person starts going and make a call to the rest of us saying, hey, our initiator's going in, follow up on their damage and you'll get a kill. Keep going after our Yamato. Follow up, follow up here, great damage. Like, and I'm, I'm even calling their focus fire. Like Yamato's on Mo and Krill, focus fire Mo and Krill here. I'm on them in three seconds, right? Uh, this is again, very like activating for the team where you notice I didn't like kind of set up like exactly how this will be orchestrated, but listening to what comes naturally to this person and the context that helped them thrive and succeed. Suddenly our Yamato is now 0-4, but the rest of our team collapsed, got a really great kill, and now we're kind of death balling up that lane and getting objectives we didn't, we wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Um, even looking at other people, like, you know, if someone is uh, making maybe, for example, a lot of calls that, you know, I might make a different one, uh, I'll look at someone like that and say like, you know, these are really constructive calls. In the next case, do you think it would be better for us to do A or B, right? And kind of giving them that choice helps them kind of buy into what we're doing together as a team. Or they might propose something like C, which I wasn't really aware of, right? Uh, so again, it's like kind of that collaboration amongst the team of saying like, wow, if someone wants to contribute something to our group, how do I facilitate that? Um, finally, I might look at someone like, let's say someone is like super passive, like never dies, uh, and just, just like farming really well, right? Maybe they have a ton of souls, but they're not super aggressive and they're, you know, kind of hesitant to play in a team fight because they don't want to feed too much. Uh, so I might look at a player like this and say, that's great. Uh, like it, let's say it's a haze in this case, right? Uh, so for our haze, I might say like, keep farming. This is sick. I want you to buy curse, right? And I want you to wait for opportunities for us to call who to curse. We're going to have you curse their hard carry at the start of each of these team fights. Maybe it's their Abrams. So let's say, Hayes, you're going to curse Abrams on my call when we start team fights. That's it. Because you can afford curse so early. It's an expensive item. And it'll help you stay alive when you have like basically a get in, do something and get out. So again, this person like has maybe not said anything on Mike all game, but it plays to their strengths. They're farming really well. They're uh, staying alive. Uh, so, But it kind of brings them into the fold in a way that takes what they're already naturally good at and elevates it to a level that can convert these into team fight win, like, you know, into getting the frag, into winning the team fight, into winning the objective, winning the round. 
Uh, so that's just another example of what main calling could look like for you and the way that you kind of create these op openings and opportunities for your team. Uh, and there's plenty more. I mean, you can go and look up any of the famous in-game leaders and main callers from so many different games and kind of see what works for you. But of course, just practice and try. Um, Wait, so I guess the last thing I wanted to add is when you are this main caller, um, something that is very important to keep in mind is the win rests on your shoulders, right? So if you're making calls and the team isn't responding to them or isn't responding well or they're going poorly and you're losing now, some people will blame the team and say, you're not listening to me. Some people will stop calling and give up, right? But really the game is resting on your shoulders to have that strategy. Like your plan A is the most important part, but you have to have a plan B and a plan C, those fallback plans. So uh, you might imagine in a world where uh, let's say, okay, so you go for the Rejuvenator, they steal it, and they, you know, take down half your team in the process. Uh, so you're on the back foot, right? This is a really bad situation. Um, so what does it look like for you as the main caller to take this responsibility and bear it on your shoulders? Now, what that looks like, as I just sort of weigh it up in, in the moment here, is to say, okay... We have a couple things. So there's the objectives, right, of us playing lanes. There's keeping ourselves alive. And there's like the, you know, basically the threat of us losing the game if they kind of hard shove a certain lane. So what I would look for in a situation like that is to say, we cannot succeed in this situation. What does it look like to fail the least? Uh, so what I might say is, everyone who's alive, abandon your lanes. We are playing together in spawn. Basically what that does is it trades and says, okay, we are not giving up any of our you know, anyone who's alive, giving up any souls to them in terms of uh, getting kills. However, we are winning basically the security of keeping all of our players alive and keeping our base alive, right? So in that case, I made the executive call to say, we are purposely losing out on our lanes. We are purposely winning on defending our base and successfully working together as a group over there. And of course your team might have complaints of like, no, we can't give up our lanes because then it'll be so hard for us to claw back in. And like, that's, I would say a case where as the main caller, if you give this up, your team will like, you know, if you, if you do nothing, your team has an even worse chance of winning. So making those executive tough calls of saying like, okay, I have to give up something, but I can get us something in return. And that can work with that. You know, uh, that that's again, where the game sort of falls in your shoulders. Uh, likewise, when your team is looking to win the game, drawing up what that winning condition is, is again, your responsibility as, as the main caller, right? So when you're at their base, if you say, you know, hey, we should, uh, you know, push all together as a group. We have better crowd control than them. So anyone who gets close to us dies. Anyone who stays far away can't stop us from getting the uh, objectives, right? Uh, so that's one way of, of victory there. In other ways, you might say, hey, let's split push on like the wide lanes of the, of the game. You know, once we have them in that crossfire, uh, they can't really focus us all effectively and we can close in on the, on the patron and things like that. Um, so yeah, even saying things like, our objective here is to basically wipe their entire team so we can get the objectives. Otherwise, hey, we have a lot more HP than them. Our goal is to just whittle down the objective and keep them alive. Let them spam at us from, you know, as they're regenerating their health and spawn, who cares? So again, these are all like kind of executive decisions you're looking to make as the main caller, because I'm sure you've been in a game where it's like, oh, we got the rejuvenator. We have more lanes. We have way more souls. We should win this. But then like, it's not happening, right? So again, just drawing these up, even if they're a bad call, you'll have your whole team on the same page and have a way to like constructively try and win, uh, which is, again, I think it's a lot worse if you just coast and let the game play out and then lose a game that you were in a winning position for. Um, great. So now I'll move on to the secondary caller. Now, the secondary caller is uh, someone who like supplements the main calls a lot. Uh, and this works in a couple ways. Number one, it works on the information side. Uh, number two, it looks on like adding plays when the main caller isn't in, like isn't calling anything at the time that you think it should be called. The third way is... Um, contributing basically to the call that the main caller is working. You're sort of that like yes and uh, kind of role here in the calls, right? You know, your main caller might call a play and you'll say like, yes and, you know, maybe after that happens, let's rotate over here because we'll have a kind of a free win, you know, like uh, we'll win their tower for free as a follow-up, right? So that's something the main caller didn't consider, but is good a value to add to the team of like follow-up. Now, more philosophically here, when you're that secondary caller, uh, I gave some examples here of like what it looks like to supplement, but how do you find like the right spots to supplement? Like what am I supplementing and when am I supplementing it? And where do I fit it into the call overall? Uh, I mentioned, yeah, I think it's from like acting or something. I don't know, like where you want to say yes and, and kind of build on someone's play. Uh, most notably, you're not the person who counter calls the main caller, right? And like, you know, if they make a call that you don't agree with, saying no and canceling it and overriding it is not really constructive. Uh, it is in the most dire situations. We'll get to counter calling in a little bit, but um, like in like, I don't know, five minutes or something, but 
yeah, what I wanted to say is like, as the secondary caller, you're looking for ways to like improve the play or improve situations that don't have plays. Now, I think the way this works best is to basically find what the strengths are of your main caller and listen to what their weaknesses are and help supplement those weaknesses, right? Let's say you have a main caller in a game who is so good at calling the start of fights, right? Maybe they're that drill sergeant that says, you go here to start, they go there, and we're going to do X, Y, and Z at seconds 23, 51, and 58, you know? Um, uh, that's also, by the way, a huge tip. Like if you take nothing else away from this video, take away that making calls based on the clock, say like, hey, let's go for this play at 714. Uh, or saying we're all doing this thing in eight seconds, get ready, I'll give us a three, two, one, and then counting three, two, one, gets really everyone on the same page. Anyway, listening, let's say you have a main caller that does such a good job of getting everyone in the play and starting off this fight, but they kind of consistently are just not calling the right time to leave a play. Like they don't have great vision onto when it's falling apart or when the enemy has like, let's say their alt timers are up or they're getting their respawners in and your main caller just doesn't track the timings that well. You as a secondary caller can add so much value to this play and to your team as a whole if you are the person who like, you know, helps the main caller start this play. You're all in on the play. It's going well, it's going poorly, whatever. But then you, after 15 seconds of this team fight, say, we're losing this. We are right now in a 3v4 and their spawners are going to come up a lot faster. So we, we got to disengage now, right? That's huge value add as, as a supplementary caller. Um, Another case of that supplementary call is maybe your main caller kind of went all in on this fight and it does work this time, right? And you get this huge team fight, your main caller did it, like wiping the sweat from their brow of like calling the God fight. Uh, but maybe there isn't that follow-up of like, do we go for rejuvenator? Do we go for the win? Do we split up and farm, right? So for you as a secondary caller is to say like, oh, there isn't a call being made right now, but there should be. Uh, so, hey, everyone, let's go for rejuvenator. Again, even if it's a bad call, it's way better to group everyone up and do the same thing together. So these are sort of the supplementary calls that, that a secondary call is really valuable for. Um, so this is for people who like, you know, if you don't feel comfortable of resting the whole game on your shoulders, but you feel like you're sharp on what should be happening and when, uh, this is the way for you to kind of contribute in that fashion and to say like, yes, like I want someone else to do what we're doing, but I'm going to make basically those like extra calls that help seal the win or help prevent a loss at the last second. So in the secondary calling and for everyone else on the team in general, I wanted to go over basically counter calling, right? What does it look like to cancel a play? Uh, because this I mentioned is generally either pretty bad to completely catastrophic where even if your main caller calls a play that has only a 30% chance of winning, I think if you call, if you say cancel, let's not do that. Your whole team is now sitting there like listless, you know, not doing anything, not going anywhere not having something to really gravitate towards while you're like kind of bickering and figuring this out. So the question I always like to ask is, even if you're right, how valuable is it to be right in this moment? Uh, and almost always the answer is not valuable. Now it is valuable if again, it's like a game losing play, right? Let's say your main caller calls, let's go for rejuvenator. And you're like, oh my God, they're like Abrams and Infernus and Dynamo are all up in uh, like four seconds, which is plenty of time for them to get here when the Rejuvenator is descending to steal. This is a horrible play. Uh, so what you might say to your main caller is then to be very clear and say, cancel, right? As loud as you can. No, cancel that play, cancel. Uh, and to very briefly offer something else that we should do instead, right? Uh, what you don't want to see is like, we shouldn't go for this, like, you know, and like taking a long time to bicker uh, because your team has already started rotating as soon as they called this, right? So by the time you nitpick and disagree, your whole team's like going to get there. And like, how many times have you seen it? Like we get to the rejuvenator and like someone believes you and thinks you're right. So they're, they're already gone. And then, you know, another person, like you're kind of half committed to this. So you probably didn't go as fast as you could have if you went all in. And then finally, after you give your spiel, you convince a third person to not go in on this play. So it's like, oh my God, now we're not going for the rejuvenator and we're not doing anything else. Like even if this is a bad play, now we have nothing in exchange, right? Uh, so I think offering something else instead that's very actionable is super important to canceling plays. So you might say like cancel, we lose if, if we do this because of their ults. Let's uh, shove the, the last two walkers instead. Let's split up three and three uh, and your main color, like, you know, and then ask like main color, who do you want in, in blue lane, right? Um, so again, that's giving like a really actionable play of like, what does it look like for us to succeed, even though we're canceling the play? Um, and now this comes like, and also anyone on the team can cancel plays, but you want to, again, be very, very hesitant to like, even if you think 90% chance this play will fail, don't cancel only if it's like 95 and above, you know, 
Um, but okay, now I wanted to explain this too from the main caller side because it's surely so infuri infuriating and uh, uh, agitating when people cancel your play because it's like, what do they think I'm crazy? I'm not calling this for no reason. But I would caution you to number one, like try and give people the benefit of the doubt more, right? When I talked about all of us working together on a play that's not optimal is better than no play at all. Even as the main caller, if your play was objectively better, taking the time to explain it might ruin basically that window for your group. So even if someone counter calls your play, I would encourage you to be supportive in that uh, decision, right? Encourage you to say, yep, fine, let's cancel. Uh, instead, yeah, let's bring, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z over to blue lane. Everyone else go green. Uh, so, right. In those cases, like you can kind of understand that as the main caller, you want to let go and you want to kind of give your teammates the benefit of the doubt. Again, they're not like crazy, you know, they're saying, you're saying what you're saying for a reason, so are they. So kind of give them that grace every so often. Um, and hey, if your call, if you're so serious about your call, you can double down uh, and, and really try and fight for it. But then if they, or at this point, you made the call, they canceled it, you canceled the cancel, but now you're also taking the chance of inviting the canceled cancel cancel, right? Um, so that's not helpful for anybody. Uh, so you, you know you have to stop the the break the cycle at some point. Um, but basically, yeah, I just kind of want to give an overview of like what it looks like to contribute um, like two cancel calls, right? Basically, you're looking for cases where it will lose the game for our team, uh, or it's like severely a misplay of something, especially someone might not have noticed. And kind of giving that context is super super helpful. Uh, so as a team, you want to avoid that at all costs, unless it's super necessary. And as a leader, if someone is really making this call and insisting to you that it's necessary, try and give them that that benefit of the doubt and say like, great, let's go all in on this person's play, even if I don't understand it. Great. So we've covered, uh, so general communications, uh, in-game leading as the leader, the shot caller, we've covered um, secondary calling and supplementing what it looks like for anyone on the team to kind of add to our strategy as a whole or add to individual tactics that'll lead to material advantages. Uh, finally, what does it look like for everybody else, right? Uh, so if you're someone who doesn't like communicating a lot, uh, then dear God, you must be suffering here at the 27 minute mark. Sorry, I communicated at you I'll, I'll like that. Uh, but if you're a person like that who doesn't love communicating, uh, or maybe you do, but you're not sure how, or you like when other people communicate, but when it's not happening in the right way, you get frustrated, right? Uh, I kind of wanted to go over some ways that like you can effectively communicate what you're doing and how you work and also how you sort of relate to the team as a whole, right? I gave that example at the beginning of the game. Let's say you're someone who never uses their mic, but you drop 40 frags every single game and it's like, why don't I have a 100% win rate, you know? Uh, so for people like this, basically, what I'm looking for is um, like what does it look like to effectively communicate, right? I would explore a little more with pings, for example, right? Uh, you know, if you're basically doing really well in your lane, uh, you might say like start pinging other lanes or, you know, using like headed to orange or whatever the voice lines. Um, Cause right now you might think like, of course I'm winning my lane. Of course I'm going to gank orange. And of course we're going to win this fight, but your teammate orange might just like not be expecting you. So maybe when you're like halfway there, they actually back up to base and go and get more health. But you're like, where is my teammate? And the teammate is like, why are you here now? Um, so having that communication is really powerful. Um, and actually that reminds me, there's an old game theory game, like again, studying strategic decision-making is uh, the, the study of game theory. So there's a game, I think it's called Battle of the Sexes, where it's like date night and the husband and wife both want to go to like, you know, the husband wants to go to the boxing match and the wife wants to go to the ballet, except they can't communicate. Uh, so the game is like, you know, the husband's best case scenario is going to the boxing match with the wife and having the date together. And if the wife doesn't come, he'd rather at least be at the ballet together with her, or maybe he'd kind of rather being at the, the boxing match by himself if they both go their separate ways that night. But the worst case scenario is he goes to the ballet when the wife actually tried to do what he wanted to do and go to the boxing match. Now they're both in the worst case scenario, you know? And of course, communication solves this basically. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways for the communication to impact it. But point is, um, you know, you avoid that worst case scenario of you showing up to the ballet, but you're, the person you're helping gank went to the boxing match and spawn. Um, so yeah, again, just kind of coming up with ways basically to make it idiot proof and say like, I'm going to contribute this thing. Here's what to do with it and when to do things with it, or here's to let everyone else know that it's happening. Right. Um, another case, like if you have those 40, 40 frags in the game, it's like as a main caller, if, if I'm like way across, like not in your lane, I might not know how, like, are you just like, 
uh, in a really good lane matchup or against this team? Or do you have like kind of a special way you're playing? Like maybe you're opening all these fights and never die, right? Like if, if you can just like kind of sustain yourself over a while that your team might not be aware of. Uh, kind of saying even just in chat, maybe after you die one time, if you're frustrated after a fight, if you're like, I'm drawing their aggro, please go when I go. That's something that's so powerful to your team, especially for your main caller, right? For us to see like, oh, we can all find success together by going all in on this play when this person does it. Got it. That's like the one thing that changes the entire game moving forward. Um, and I know it can be like kind of cringe or uncomfortable if you like say something and maybe people don't listen or maybe people make fun of you. Or maybe they, it's like... Uh, I don't know, maybe you try it and it doesn't work. And then you're like, well, why'd I even try? Uh, but I think in these cases, again, it kind of lends to like, we can help the team succeed and win if I help show them what I'm good at and when I'm doing things, basically so people can react and respond to it. Um, finally, you might have a situation where like, I don't know if people call like, oh, let's all go for this walker together. But you're like, I don't know, maybe you have like really good speed and you have like the needle to thread where you can take the urn uh but you're not someone who wants to explain that whole thing of like i'm not going to come and help you with this walker on the outer lane because i have enough speed to take the urn and finish urn before they get their spawner back in the lane that if you don't want to do that that's fine but i think it's really valuable for basically you know for your main caller to call all right let's go for this out outer lane walker and you just give the voice line no fantastic you know your main caller can say like Okay, uh, we don't have enough people for this, let's not. Or they'll know, got it, we can still take this with five instead of six. Okay, thank you for letting us know. Um, you know, again, this kind of like makes it less ambiguous. And I, I kind of mentioned at the beginning of the, the chat here that if you're someone who like has seen teammates just doing the wrong thing at the wrong time and are so frustrated by it, I think even as someone who doesn't love communicating, there are a lot of ways for you to get back into the game and in situations like this. Um, so yeah, and I want you to like basically come away from this, uh, with, with some examples, right. And, you know, kind of taking it all the way back to the start. Uh, what does it look like for us to communicate effectively as a group? Um, I gave some examples, so I'll, I'll just kind of walk through the way a game might look uh, in a hypothetical scenario. And you can kind of feel out like what, it, where do you feel comfortable sort of in this, in these dynamics or what maybe did I not mention that you think you do really well that actually would communicate even more than I'm than I'm giving in this example, right? All these things are really constructive. So just kind of walk through this this thought process for a game as a whole and a team as a whole. So, okay, you load into a game. I mentioned first off, your, your main caller might say, um, hey, we have a lot of uh, debuffs on our team. So what we want to do is kind of focus all these debuffs on one person at the same time. So look for my call. We're going to uh, basically see who on their team team is doing the most damage, getting the most kills right away. From there, I'm going to call focus fire our debuff abilities onto this person. And that's how we'll sort of take our, our fights overall. Uh, now, maybe as the main caller says this, uh, someone else might say like, and actually, yeah, like I'm, uh, I'm actually going to go a healer build in that case where when we're debuffing them, I want to make sure we don't die ourselves. So I'll supplement that as a secondary call and say, I'm going to go healer as a result of that. And I'll call when I'm making my heals. Uh, finally, you're zip lining in, right? And you know, Maybe you're someone who is uh, like, okay, yeah, like let's say you're someone who doesn't like communicating at all. Maybe you're laning with someone who says, great, I'm, uh, let's see, I don't know, I'm seven and I'm going to go for a stun on somebody. Or let's say I'm Haze, right? I'm, I'm Haze and I'm going to go for a stun. And when I do that, Bebop, I want you to go for the hook after I do that, okay? Like don't use your hook until I throw the sleep dart and if I miss it, you could still go. So if you're that bebop who's totally silent, you could just type like, okay, or use a voice line or like nod with your character, whatever you want. Um, you know, but suddenly it's like, you're not getting in a situation where you, you're constantly like pulling in the enemies and you're like, why isn't my haze following up on this damage? Your haze isn't going for these lights out sleeps and being like, oh my God, why is our bebop on cooldown again? Uh, again, this makes it so much less ambiguous of how you'll work together as a team. Both of you know what you're expecting from each other. Uh, okay, and I mentioned like a Yamato like feeding in another lane, right? If they're like going 0-3, um, I might say like, hey, let me uh, switch with you, Yamato. Can I put you with a lane mate uh, if I'm in Furnace, let's say, and say, Yamato, switch with me. Uh, let's pair you up with someone else and I, I can sustain long enough to maintain the lane. Just, just play with our duo and see if that'll help you kind of leverage those picks. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but you know, maybe our Yamato dies slower, like, right? That's another win for our team. If I can say, hey, like, let's stem the bleeding here and help our Yamato die less frequently and quickly. Um, Great, so you know that's the early laning phase, right? And again, I might call like, okay, hey, Lash, can you go for a gank at the uh, 755 mark? Okay, I want you to, to push up an orange lane and I want you to um, like look for those opportunities. Uh, like when, when on our call, basically, we'll give you like a, a 10 second warning of when it's a good time to gank, right? 
Uh, so, you know, again, that maybe the lash doesn't say anything at all. Maybe they just say, okay, maybe, uh, you know, they contribute to the call and say like, actually, I'm like about to get a new item. Can you, can we make it at 805? I'll buy something in fast enough and go in together. It's like, oh my God, that's amazing. So yeah, again, effective calling and making these plays, like setting up for so much success. Like it really feels like the way I'm explaining it, every single time is so juicy, you know, like you've been in so many games, I bet, where it's like, oh, this is obviously what should happen with our Lash. It's not happening. I don't know why. Here you're making it happen, like, by real power. Think of how powerful that is and effective it is. Um, anyway, moving into a conversion, like, let's say we get our lanes. We're going for walkers together and, let's say, you know, as a main caller, great, we're looking for that debuff kind of fight. Let's wait until at least three of them are grouped up together. In the meantime, let's kind of stay in a 3v3, three, like, three and three kind of death ball on our own. Everyone kind of buddy up in these packs of three. We'll roam around the map and work together as units. Once that fight happens, we'll call to, like, who's the lightning rod on their team that we're going to debuff. Um, so now, maybe the secondary caller who's leading that second pack might say, like, oh, it's time. Their, their Kelvin is overextended. Ready? Debuff Kelvin in three, two, one. We're fighting here on blue. Uh, and that's a really effective call because now the rest of your team knows like, ooh, there's like a big opening here. Maybe we'll rotate, maybe not. Maybe in the chaos, we'll go for objectives while they were sort of drawing their players away and causing cluttering their comms, you know? Uh, there's so many great ways between like the main caller and the secondary caller to like say yes and like, great, go for the fight on blue. We're going to win the yellow walker in the meantime. Everyone keep fighting yellow here with me. Uh, we can get this objective even if we lose that fight. Um, and again, getting your team all on the same page, like, Maybe your other teammate thought, no, let's go for picks while they're rotating. Like, that's a great call. But them going for picks during the rotate, you going for the walker, it means both of you fail. So again, getting on that same page, regardless of whose play was the right play, is so powerful, so valuable. Look for plays like that. Again, whether you're the main caller, supplementing, supplementing the call as a secondary caller, whether you're someone who just has a great idea, even though you haven't said anything all game, whatever you, whatever you like. Now, again, I mentioned like mitigating losses, like, if we are losing pretty badly, how do we salvage, right? Uh, maybe we say like, hey, let's split one person up in every lane, but don't die. We want to kind of show them that we're contesting and not give up anything for free, but make them know that they have to commit resources and time to this and discuss how to beat us, right? Uh, but we won't get good farm in that entire meantime. We're going to lose a lot of souls as a result of this, but we'll keep map control and territory control. Um, it's another case of like stemming the bleeding, right? Uh, let's say you get the rejuvenator, right? And like, how do we convert this into a win? We get the rejuvenator and we say like, great, what does a win look like? Maybe we don't have all our flex slots. Let's go for the last walkers or the spawn, uh, like um, the, the shrines in the spawn, right? Uh, maybe you don't, uh, sorry, maybe you have like a, a one lane that's pushed all the way up and you say like, actually, I think we can win if we shove this lane like through the rest of the way. Ignore everything else and play for the win. Like do not leave either win or die. Uh, and that's, again, a really great call to get your team on the same page. That's a win condition. Again, it may not be the perfect play, but your whole team is like very committed to this. You won't have the case where someone goes to back up to make sure they don't feed, but it's like, we have Rejuvenator. Why are you backing up? Like, if you stayed, I was counting on you drawing their fire so I could flank or something. You know, so again, just getting everyone on the same page, understanding that context, communicating effectively and quickly. Uh, I think you're going to see yourself winning a lot more games and it feels a lot more in your control rather than, you know, getting in this game, having awful teammates, having a game you should have won, but you lost and being frustrated, logging off. Uh, like it really feels like the game is back in your control and is, is so much more of a uh, captivating experience, right? When you're able to work together with people in this effective way and able to convert like what each of you are doing as composite parts of this team into a win as a whole, as a group. Uh, so yeah, I hope this has been a helpful kind of discussion around what effective communication looks like and making calls, main calling, secondary calling, uh, not calling, what all those look like here, cancel calling, uh, what all that looks like in uh, the context of deadlock. And yeah, I've been rogue. I'm excited for this series. So thanks to Thorin's thoughts for the, the format idea here. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to kind of dig into more of the pure like esports side and cooperative side of what, uh, like how deadlock is played and things like that. So yeah, looking forward to more. Thanks so much for watching.